You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. In a small village somewhere in England, there once stood a chapel, and over the arch beside it were written the words, We preach Christ crucified. For years, godly men preached there, presenting a crucified Savior as the only means of salvation. As that generation of godly preachers passed on, there arose a different generation who considered the cross and its message to be too antiquated. So they began preaching salvation by Christ's example rather than by his blood, ignoring the necessity of his sacrifice. Meanwhile, ivy had crept up the side of the arch and covered the word crucified, and the arch now read, We preach Christ. And they did preach him, but not as having been crucified. Eventually, people in the congregation began to question the practice of confining sermons to Christ in the Bible. So the preachers began to give discourses on such topics as social issues, politics, philosophy, and moral rearmament. The ivy continued to grow until it wiped out the third word, rendering the phrase simply, We preach. The Apostle Paul wrote to the cultured Corinthians saying, quote, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. End quote. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2. The only hope of men is indeed Christ crucified, and that is the theme of Hebrews 10, 1 through 18, the primary passage we will examine over the next three days. Previously, we analyzed Christ's substitutionary death on the cross and what it accomplished from a legal standpoint. We learned that salvation from judgment demands the substitution of a death. Over the next three days, we'll see that Jesus' sacrifice was superior to any offered in the Old Testament system. His death became the great and final sacrifice that accomplished for eternity what all the other sacrifices could not. Christians today can easily become complacent in their love of Christ when they are continually exposed to a society that is only too eager to tolerate and excuse any sin. When churches reinforce that attitude by their own unwillingness to expose and deal with sin in either their congregation or leadership, believers will stagnate in their zeal for Christ. Why should they work hard at building their relationship with Him when they sense no urgent need to do so? In stark contrast, the people who lived under the Old Covenant were continually exposed to a religious system that exasperated their lack of a vital, dynamic relationship with the living God. To understand how crucial Christ's sacrifice was for you and what it accomplished, you need to first gain some insight into what it was like to live under the Mosaic Law. Under the Old Covenant, the priests remained busy from dawn to sunset, slaughtering and sacrificing animals. Particularly at Passover, many thousands were slain in a week. But no matter how many sacrifices were made or how often, they were ineffective, both individually and collectively. They failed in three ways. 1. They were unable to give anyone access to God. 2. They could not remove sin. And 3. They were only external. The great cry in the hearts of the Old Testament saints was to be in the presence of God. Exodus 33:15. Yet all the old ceremonies and sacrifices, though offered continually, could never save and never quote unquote make perfect those who draw near. End quote. Hebrews 10.1 That's because the law was only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form. The law and its ceremonies could only reflect the very form of the good things to come, the privileges and blessings that would result from the sacrifice of Christ. They were form without substance. Christ's sacrifice, however, is the very form, icon, the exact replica or reproduction of the good things to come. He brought forgiveness, peace, a clear conscience, and most significantly, access to God. The good things foreshadowed and implied in the old system came to pass in Christ. The purpose of the law was never to make perfect, to bring to completion the salvation people desired. But God did have some important goals for the law. 1. As a shadow, it pointed the people toward the coming reality of salvation. 1 Peter 1.10 
2. It served as a reminder that the penalty of sin is death. And 3. God gave his people the sacrifices as a covering for sin. When properly offered from a true heart of faith, the old sacrifices removed immediate temporal judgment from God. To despise the sacrifices was to be cut off from among his people and incur God's temporal punishment. Leviticus 17.4 So the sacrifices, while unable to bring a person into God's presence, were important in maintaining a demonstration of a person's covenantal relationship to him. The people who lived under Mosaic law sought deliverance from the sin and accompanying guilt that ate away at their consciences. But their sacrifices could not deliver them from sin. In fact, the sacrifices served as a constant reminder that they could not escape it. Would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. Hebrews 10, 2 and 3. If the sacrifices had really done their job in removing sin, the people would not have been burdened by its guilt. Their consciences were never cleansed as in Christ. If at any time the sacrificial system actually removed their guilt and brought them into fellowship with God, it would have ceased to be necessary because it would have accomplished its perfect end. But it never did. It just reminded them that it was ineffective for removing sin. Imagine how burdensome living under a system like that must have been. Instead of being able to offer the sacrifice and reap forgiveness, they were constantly aware that their next sin required yet another sacrifice which in turn was powerless to remove the sin or to purify and to free their consciences from the guilt of that sin. In fact, the more faithful and godly the person, the guiltier he was likely to feel because he was more aware of and sensitive to God's holiness and his own sinfulness. He was torn between his knowledge of God's law and his awareness of his own breaking of that law. While sin is manifested outwardly, its root is always internal. That is an unreachable area for the old sacrifices. They could not go inside a person and change him. Quote, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. End quote. Hebrews 10.4 Hebrews 9.13 and 14 clarifies for us what was necessary to transform men. If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? There was no real relationship between the death of an animal and the forgiveness of a person's moral offense against God. It was impossible for any animal to satisfy the demands of the holy God. Only Jesus Christ, the perfect union of humanity and deity, could satisfy God and purify humanity. Only his death could be the ultimate effective sacrifice. Living in that truth enables us to be truly free of guilt as we draw closer to our perfect and perfectly holy Savior.